Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, um, and welcome to this special event for UWA Research Week. Uh, my name is Brendan Waddell. I'm the Deputy Dean in the Faculty of Science here at UWA, and it's my pleasure to be the MC for tonight's uh, special event. Um, before introducing our speakers, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Western Australia, where we're meeting tonight, is situated on Noongar land, and the Noongar people remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of the land and continue to practice their values, languages, beliefs and knowledge. So, UWI Research Week, uh, this is a celebration of the research that happens in this institution across the full range of academic uh, and research interests. Um, tonight's event is one of many opportunities that the public and indeed people from across uh, the, within the university have to engage in the, in the research that happens here. So I'd encourage you, if you haven't already done so, clearly by being here tonight you're aware of UWA Research Week, uh, but if there are, other, there are plenty of other things happening this week, it's a, a really a highly active week, so I encourage you to, to look at what else is available uh, and take that up if it interests you. And there's some information in the, in the foyer outside the auditorium uh, that has that information for you. I've also been asked to encourage the Twitter users among you, uh, I'm sure there are some, uh, to tweet to the hashtag UWI Research Week, that's shown up there on that slide. And uh, you should also be aware that tonight's lecture is being filmed uh, and will be available shortly afterwards on YouTube if you want to go and check something that was said perhaps. So I'd like to acknowledge the sponsors of tonight's event, uh, the UWA Institute of Advanced Studies, the School of Anatomy, Physiology and Human Biology at UWA, and the West Australian Sleep Disorders Research Institute, based at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. So, to tonight's lecture, with the intriguing title of A Good Night's Sleep, Sleep Disorders and the Shape of Your Face. I'm sure many in the audience, perhaps everyone, uh, has a special affiliation with tonight's sleep theme. Perhaps this is a positive one, perhaps a negative one. Clearly it's something we do a lot of. We spend uh, a very large proportion of our life uh, asleep or trying to be asleep, um, and it's clearly something that we value. But as we're about to hear tonight, many of us do not get the quality of sleep that we need, and indeed the adverse consequences of sleep disorders uh, can be very substantial, uh, both personally and at a community level. So to explore why this is the case, I'd like to introduce tonight's two speakers. And because they're going to work as somewhat of a tag team, I'll introduce both of them at the outset, and then the first speaker will just pass to the second. Um, at the completion of the joint lecture, there will be an opportunity for some questions from the floor. So that's something to look forward to at the end. So our first speaker tonight is Professor Peter Eastwood, who heads the Centre for Sleep Science at UWA. Peter and his research colleagues at the West Australian Sleep Disorders Research Institute at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital have had a long-standing interest in the understanding of mechanisms uh, underlying obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, Peter is also the scientific director of the West Australian Pregnancy, the RAIN cohort, uh, the deputy director of the Institute for Respiratory Health, editor-in-chief of Respirology, the major respiratory medicine journal of the Asian Pacific region and he holds joint appointments as a professor at UWA, an NHMRC senior research fellow at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital, and an adjunct professor at Curtin University. Our second speaker tonight is Associate Professor Ajmal Mian, and he leads the Machine Intelligence Group in the School of Computer Science and Software Engineering at UWA. Ajmal's research areas include artificial intelligence, computer vision, machine learning, 3D shape analysis and pattern recognition. Ajmal has secured numerous distinctions and awards, including Early Career Scientist of the Year in 2012, the Australasian Distinguished Doctoral Dissertation Award from the Computing Research and Education Association of Australasia, and UWA, UWA Awards, the Vice-Chancellor's Mid-Career Research Award, and the Outstanding Young Investigator Award. So uh, clearly a very impressive CV. Ajmal is currently collaborating with a number of groups, including the UWA Centre for Sleep Science uh, and several other groups across the university to solve multidisciplinary research problems. And this multidisciplinary approach has become 
uh, more and more important to, uh, to, uh, to look into the real problems that are, we're facing. So now to commence tonight's lecture, would you please welcome Professor Peter Eastwood. Um, thank you very much, Brendan, um, and thank you all of you for taking the time to come out this evening and listen to what we've been up to. Um, it is an intriguing title, and hopefully we'll present some intriguing data um, about uh, the diagnosis of one of these sleep disorders in particular, which is obstructive sleep apnea. Um, I'm going to start with something, I'll say, visually noisy. This person is fast asleep. He's trying to breathe. He's still fast asleep. He will wake up in just a second. So for some of you, you think they ring a bell? Yeah, I think so, for some of you. Um, that person has got severe obstructive sleep apnea. And it's interesting because the, the dangerous bits of what you saw and heard then are not the noisy bits, it's actually the quiet bit in the middle. And this slide explains why that's the case. Um, what we have here is the kind of signals that we would record if you came to a sleep clinic and stayed overnight. And these are the most important ones in the main. So, here we have on top um, a signal of your oxygen levels in your blood, so your blood oxygen saturation. This one here is your airflow through your nose and your mouth. This signal here is it's a measure of the pressure inside your thorax, so it's esophageal pressure is what we use. So a small balloon gets passed down into your stomach. That's not what we do normally. This is a research uh, level investigation. And this is your blood pressure. The first thing to note is that there are periods where there's just not much flow. And that's what you heard on the, on the slide before, those periods of quietness was this person not getting any flow into his lungs. And that's not because he's not trying, because here, this is a measure of respiratory effort. And what this tells me is that his person is making larger and larger and stronger and stronger respiratory efforts. So it's generating more sucking pressure in his thorax to try and get air in there with every single breath. But there's no flow. As a consequence of that, we're still using oxygen, we're still producing carbon dioxide, so our oxygen levels start dropping down. And th there's a bit of an offset here because the, the, the oxygen is measured from the finger. So imagine putting this low point here to this point right here. So at a point when your oxygen levels get so low and CO2 gets so high that the brain says enough of this, it wakes you up. And what it does when it wakes you up is all the muscles in your upper airway, they suddenly come on, and that's when you hear this big, the big snort. That is obstructive sleep apnea. The consequences are profound. When you recover from sleep, quite often you're not aware that you've woken up, so it's just below consciousness. But your blood pressure knows you've woken up. And look what happens to your blood pressure. A huge surge in blood pressure when you wake up from an apnea. This person, <coughs> excuse me, is, is chronically sleep deprived. They never get into that deep sleep which is required because every time they get there, the airway closes and this cycle repeats itself. So as a consequence of this blood pressure surges, as a consequence of these huge efforts during sleep, and as a consequence of these intermittent changes in hypoxia, in, in blood oxygen levels, this person has chronic hypertension. They have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, of stroke, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, they are chronically sleep deprived. Right? Sleep deprivation and daytime tiredness is the cardinal symptom of obstructive sleep apnea. So, now knowing that, this is another person with sleep apnea, let's have a think about what's going on here. <coughs> Making a couple of efforts, he's obviously probably just woken up cuffing and splurting and carrying on, and the brain says, I want you to go back to sleep. So it sends him back to sleep, and you can see him, he's making big efforts with his, not right now, but in a moment, big efforts with his, with his uh, abdomen, with his stomach, but you hear nothing. His airway is completely collapsed. Oxygen's going down, carbon dioxide's going up, 
eventually we'll get to a point where the brain says enough of this and wakes you up. And that's what you'll see in a moment. <clears throat> Notice also he's on his back. Notice he's a bit overweight. Okay. This is the kind of person we have coming to our sleep clinics all the time. This person doesn't bring himself in here. It's usually his partner that sends him in there. The ones who are lying there trying to stop him breathing all night long or wake him up and to stop the snoring. So I mentioned that the daytime consequences of this. It's, it's, um, you know, snoring for many years was thought to be a kind of a bit of a laughing matter, but we now know it's not. It's, not a, it's a pathway to, to what we saw in those two videos. We know that uh, individuals with sleep apnea have terrible daytime sleepiness. We know that there is an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. We know that there is an increased risk of having depression if you have sleep apnea. And we know that there is a three to four fold increase of having motor vehicle accidents if you have obstructive sleep apnea. It is very, very common. The most recent estimates of the prevalence of sleep apnea is about 6% in middle-aged women and about 13% in middle-aged men. And that's sleep apnea of a clinically significant level. The challenge for us, though, is to detect and diagnose sleep apnea because what we also know is that about 90% of people who have sleep apnea are currently undiagnosed. Why is that? Well, it's probably because the diagnosis is so complex. Some of you may have gone to a sleep clinic and been set up. It takes about an hour to set you up for a sleep study. You get set up with all these wires to measure your, your brain function, whether you're awake and asleep. Little probes, little prongs under your nose to measure your breathing. Uh, straps around your chest to measure your, your kind of respiratory efforts. Uh, oxygen saturation. Um, electrodes on your legs to measure leg movements. All kinds of things. It takes about an hour. And then you're supposed to sleep with this stuff on. And most people do because most people that come in are chronically sleep deprived. But you can see it's not only very intensive for you, it's also very labour intensive and incredibly expensive. We're talking about a, an eight to 10 hour medical procedure. This is the kind of measurements we make. And I'm showing you this because um, I think it's actually really important that you understand what we're trying to do when someone comes in for a sleep study. Look at this, this top pane here. Um, this top pane here is a 30 second pane from this point to that point, whereas this bottom one is a five minute block. And what we have here is, is the brain essentially. So this is the, the brain wave here, another brain wave here. This is eye movement here, eye movement here. And this is muscle activity recorded from just under the chin. So it's a skeletal muscle. So it reflects pretty much any skeletal muscles in the body. When we fall asleep, they relax. Okay. So down here we have our oxygen saturation levels we spoke about. This is that breathing pattern, big breath, no effort, big breath, no effort. This is the movement of the, the rib cage, the chest, the abdomen. This is um, snoring intensity down here. And this is a, a body position. In this case, this person's on their back. The first thing I can see here is that this person is having periods of apneas. So cessation of breathing, no flow. And each of these events is about 30 seconds long. So this person's not breathing every few minutes for 30 seconds. The consequence of that, oxygen saturation goes down. We know it's obstructive. We know, there's so, we know somewhere in the throat there is a collapse because he's still making respiratory efforts, but there's no flow. What happens at this point right here? Well, the brain wakes up. We can see that very clearly here. The muscles turn back on, and that's when the big snort occurs. So this person has, has obviously severe obstructive sleep apnea. They have an obstruction every 30 seconds, essentially. This person never, ever, ever gets into deep sleep. They are just walking exhausted. And how do we classify someone's severity of sleep apnea? Well, we, we essentially just count those respiratory events. We count the number of times you stop breathing. So someone with mild sleep apnea stops breathing between five and 15 times per hour. With moderate sleep apnea, 15 to 30 times an hour. Severe sleep apnea greater than 30 times an hour. Interestingly, we all do this, but we all do it to a much less degree. And, uh, and, and uh, currently, we think that less than five of these events per hour is pretty normal. So, so there's been a lot of research going on about how to diagnose sleep apnea without having to have someone come into the sleep clinic for that big complex test. 
And a lot of investigation has gone on looking at risk factors. And we know that being obese is a risk factor. The larger you are, the more mass around the neck, the more the airway, this throat, is being compressed. So the more susceptible it is to being collapsed during sleep. Unfortunately, if you're male, you have an increased risk of having sleep apnea. We also know that. As you get older, your risk of sleep apnea increases. Um, and no one's really quite sure why that's the case, but it may relate to you know, a generalised decrease in loss of skeletal muscle tone, a bit more elastic, a bit floppier, and that's also reflected up here. You know, perhaps the airway gets floppier, less capable of resisting those collapsing forces during sleep. Um, alcohol, absolute risk factor for sleep apnea. It's a central nervous system depressant. It, just, it slows all the muscles down, it stops them contracting, it makes the airway less able to protect itself. And we know that smoking is a, it's an, it's an, it causes inflammation of the upper airway. So you smoke, airway gets inflamed, it gets smaller, easier to collapse. So all of those things affect the throat and make the airway more collapsible. What about craniofacial structure? What about the shape of your face, both inside and outside? Well, this is a, uh, an MRI scan of someone's head uh, from the side. And you can see here, so this is the nose here, and this is, if you were breathing, you'd breathe through the nose, down the back of the throat, into the larynx, into the, uh, the lungs and the airway. Or you can breathe through the mouth. And the two main structures to look at here, are this one here, which is your tongue. This one here, which is your, that's the hard palate, so that's the thing that, you know, put your finger in your mouth and put it up there, and the hard bit, that's the hard palate. And this is the, the uvula and the soft palate here, so the, the dangly bit in the back of your throat is the uvula. And I'm going to show this video. What it shows is this person's breathing away, trying to breathe. And you can see that the uvula and the tongue are flipping around. They're actually pressing against the back of the throat. In fact, when this person tries to make a breath in, it stays stuck there. And all they can do is either wake up or open their mouth, which they've just done just then, to get airflow in. Right? So this is what's happening inside the throat. This is the, like the primary mechanism, if you like, of sleep apnea. How do we treat it? Well, this is my only slide on treatment. Um, we treat it with CPAP. This is the gold standard treatment of sleep apnea that we have, invented by uh, Colin Sullivan, University of New South Wales in Sydney. Um, and he uh, you know, pretty much founded a company called Resmed, one of the large, you know, greatest biomedical success stories in Australia. It's now a, an international company based out of San Diego. But the principle is so simple. Essentially, it's a mask that goes over the nose. It applies a, a small amount of positive pressure so that when you fall asleep and the airway wants to collapse, it can't because it's being mechanically splintered open. That's the whole principle of CPAP. That's the whole principle on which this company was founded, and it's a multi-billion dollar company now. So it's a big problem. Yeah. So this person, this is the same person from the slide before, but now they're wearing a CPAP mask. Right? So a bit of positive pressure applied through the nose and see what it does to the back of the throat here. You can still see the uvula is kind of flicking around and carrying on, but now th there's a pathway. You can see black. The air can go down there now. Right? It is an incredibly effective therapy, but unfortunately it's quite cumbersome. And only about 50% of people who are prescribed CPAP can tolerate it. So there's a lot of other research looking into other ways to treat sleep apnea, which is not the topic of this talk because we're interested in the diagnosis of it. So <clears throat> let's talk about craniofacial structure. This is a few more MRI images. This is from a, a paper that um, I think it came out last week. Now, it's an interesting one because it's compared the, the, the bony structure of, um, it's from Sao Paulo in Brazil, uh, a bony structure of Japanese Brazilians and Caucasians. What they did was that they reconstructed all of the, the main structures in the airway to see if there's differences. Both of these people have sleep apnea, but the Japanese Brazilians, even though they had a larger jaw, it was actually smaller in dimensions. And they also had smaller tongue and fat. So this is a reconstruction of that. And contrast this to the, the Caucasian, who has a larger, kind of a larger area, but they have much more tongue and fat in there. So you can imagine this, this, it's like a, we're working in a bony box, which is the bottom jaw, right? and we've got this soft tissue that if it starts expanding, which way can it go? It can't go that way because there's bone around it. It can go down, double chin, or it can go back and cause sleep apnea. Right? So that's, that's, that's the, the interesting internal um, 
mechanisms of sleep apnea which you can pick from MRI scans. They're very expensive, hard to do dynamically, and certainly not a kind of a standard diagnostic tool that we can roll out um, in the sleep clinic. So question, can we get at what's happening internally from simple external photographs? This was a question that was asked by a group in Sydney a few years ago, well actually in 2009, and they took photographs of this person's face at the front and at the side and just made a series of linear measurements. And indeed they found that there were certain um, facial characteristics that predicted an increased risk of sleep apnea. Things like you know, a smaller jaw. And you can imagine why that's a problem because you've got less space for that soft tissue. Things like a retruded jaw, yeah, and like our jaw goes back. The opposite would be you know, Arnie Schwarzenegger, not got sleep apnea, no chance, you know, the big, the big jaw. Um, and things like a smaller, you know, smaller face, uh, larger tongue, double chin, big neck. Large neck, big problem. We know that, big risk factor for sleep apnea. Why? Because this is all the tissue that's now compressing against that airway, which is trying to stay open during sleep. So obesity, neck circumference, they're all things which are risk factors. However, it's a two-dimensional reconstruction of what's essentially a three-dimensional structure, which is our face. So our interest has been in um, making three-dimensional images. And I've been working with Arjmal, who'll be up in a moment, uh, using these three-dimensional images to try and see if we can identify characteristics on the human face that can predict sleep apnea. This is the device we're using. It's called 3DMD, and it takes six photographs simultaneously. It takes less than a second to take a photograph. Um, it provides a couple of um, uh, infrared photographs here and a couple of the normal ones and meshes them all together and gives you a quantitative image of the, of the face. This is me. Um, this is one, one we took a week ago and it's, uh, it just shows you how quick it is. That's me standing in front of the, sitting in front of the camera. Photograph gets taken, image gets reconstructed. We then quickly hop into the analysis package which is that, it's now three-dimensional, it's now quantitative, and you can do things to it. Right? Arjmal prefers this kind of grey scale thing where you take away all the colour and the features so he can do his mathematical stuff to it. And that's, so that's the format that we tend to use. Right? So that's me. This is uh, Maddie McAllister, who's unfortunately not here. Now she's doing her PhD uh, currently at WA in marine archaeology. She's diving on these shipwrecks taking photographs of shipwrecks and reconstructing them in 3D. So we kind of got to know her a bit through that. She's supposed to be here so she can see, you can see what she looks like really, but unfortunately she's not. But we took a photograph of her as well. And the reason I'm showing you this is because Arjmal is going to use both my photo and Maddie's um, in, his, in his part of his presentation. Again, quick reconstruction. It, it is that quick to do this. But it's, it's accurate in a three-dimensional sense. Each point has an XY plot to the, you know, the sub-millimeter level. And that's the XY plots thrown there. Get back to the grayscale. You can spin it round, and you can make very accurate measurements, both curvilinear measurements or geodesic linear measurements. You can determine volumes, angles, all kinds of things from this. So we now have a very sophisticated way of looking at the face. So the challenge is, so we have this, we want to know the relationship between measurements on the face and sleep apnea. Two big challenges. So we have, what is the input variable? It's the, it's the face. We want to make measurements of it. Now, Arjumar is going to explain this better than me, and I, every time I explain it, I change how I explain it. So he always frowns at me. But this is essentially that kind of grayscale face. And what this is, is a, an average face of 4,000 faces. Right? And that face is characterised by a whole bunch of different switches that characterise different landmarks. This, this average face is 0, 0, 0, 0. So maybe there's, maybe there's 40 switches. I don't know how many there are, Arjmal. 200 switches. So 200 switches. So now if I adjust those 200 switches, I can go from that face to this person, which is this person. If I adjust the switches in a different way, I can go from that face to this face to this person. So now we can actually apply numbers to this face input. What about the output? We want to know severity of sleep apnea. Huge challenge because I don't want to have to go to a sleep lab every time I do this, but we have to for this. We have to get this measurement, which is number of events per hour, to make this thing worthwhile. Um, so we want, we don't want to go just to a sleep clinic because everyone's got sleep apnea. We need to go to the community. Very hard thing to do. 
So what we've done is we've gone to the RAIN study, um, which is a, a, one of the first, well, it is the first birth cohort in the world uh, from Western Australia. 25 years ago, 3,000 mums went to King Edward Memorial Hospital and they all got ultrasounds. Half of them had one ultrasound, half of them had three, uh, four ultrasounds, um, and then they were followed for many years to, many years to go, and they're now 25 years old. Um, it started with John Newnham and Fiona Stanley, Lou Landau, they in initial, initiated this thing. Uh, Jenny Mountain, the study manager, is in the back there somewhere. Um, and this is it, and what we've done, it, it's, it's a cross-section of Western Australia, of these kids. So at 22 years old, when they were 22 years old, we got them all to come into our university sleep clinic and have a full overnight sleep study. Never been done before. So now we have this objective measurement in a population of young people. What we now need is to, so we, we've done a thousand of them. That was 200. We've done a thousand of them. What we now need to do is, is middle-aged people from the, from the community, not from a sleep clinic. And we're actually in the process right now of studying uh, the parents of these RAIN kids. So we've got their mums and dads coming in. And we're hoping over the next year and a half to do 1,200 of them. The last thing we need to do is get a sleep clinic population. And we're doing that if we get funding, in HMRC is what we go for, but it's that one of the great challenges in research is funding what we do. This is what we're trying to do over the next two years, is collect all the patients that come into our sleep clinic at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. Get that information. Um, this is some preliminary data. We're pretty excited about this. Uh, we're hoping to get 1,000 RAIN study 20-year-olds. We've got them. I'm presenting data from 34 of them. They're the blue dots. We will get uh, their parents right now. Haven't got any data just yet of them. And we're hoping to get two and a half thousand of the sleep clinic patients. I'm showing you data from 30 of them. So this is the kind of preliminary data showing something really interesting, which is that there is a relationship between severity of sleep apnea measured with the gold standard test in a sleep lab and what Arjmal can spit out in terms of numbers from those analyses in a tiny number of people. So I think it's really exciting. What's this going to look like when we start getting the whole lot in there? Can we take one of your photographs put it in the algorithm and say, you have X percent risk of having sleep apnea. Uh, and that's what we're trying to get to. So, oh, and that's Arjmal spinning around there. So I'm going to hand over to Arjmal. Uh, thanks, Peter. So Peter has talked about all the exciting stuff. I'm going to get to the boring stuff as to how to analyze uh, 3D faces. And uh, why do we actually? Okay, so why do we actually analyze what we analyze? Why, why do we take out the texture and we look at the grayscale images itself? So every face tells a story. And inside that story, we are interested in the facial features that tells us about the sleep apnea. So faces tell us about a lot of things, but we are only interested about a, a part of that information and how to extract that information. This is what I'm going to explain. Right. So we are looking for invariant features, features that do not vary by any other measure except with respect to sleep. So there are two aspects of the face. One is the texture, what is the, the coloring you could uh, call it, and what is the 3D shape of the face. So we can see in this picture that the texture can be varied a lot, and the texture basically does not follow the underlying facial morphology. Sorry, I keep clicking this uh, right button. So <clears throat> why study 3D faces? Why can't we do what we are trying to do with just 2D images? This is because the appearance, which we call the 2D images, the photographs, the, uh, the photographs that we take with our conventional cameras, they are very sensitive to lighting. For example, you turn off all lights, you get a black picture. Nothing in there on one extreme. You take the light on the right side, you t get one type of picture, you take the light on the other side, you, take, uh, you, you get a different type of picture. Then there is the makeup. You know, sometimes you have eyebrows that are thin, sometimes the eyebrows could be uh, thicker. So that does not really tell us about the morphology of the uh, face. And the other problem is the pose. You know, it's, uh, it depends upon how the person is looking at the camera. So we could get different sides or slight variations in the face. 3D faces, on the other hand, that do not change not easily. So we're not talking about uh, induced changes such as facial expressions or a person opening their mouth, but they do not change due to these mo noisy measures which we are trying to avoid in our measurements. And the other most advantageous part of 3D face is 
which Peter has already talked about, is that we can perform absolute measurements on the face, on the 3D face. On pixels, we can only measure in terms of pixel values. For example, these two points are 10 pixels apart. Now, 10 pixels from a satellite image could mean two different countries. But on 3D faces, if we have the 3D coordinates of those two pixels between which we are measuring the 3D distance, we'll get it exactly in absolute coordinates, for example, in millimeters. Right. So starting with simple 3D face analysis, which uh, probably some research groups have already done, the easiest way is to go click on some landmarks and measure distances between these landmarks. And these are called point-to-point -point distances. They can be easily annotated by human annotators. And uh, it's very easy to measure linear distances between them. And the correspondences already exist between these points. For example, if I click the left eye corner on one subject, then I click the left eye corner on all the subjects. So I know that this point corresponds to the left eye corner. And if I have the right eye corner, I can measure the distance between these two points. So thus, we are sure that we are comparing apples to apples. So in all scientific analysis, we have to be sure that we compare apples to apples and derive our analysis and find out what is causing the uh, condition that we are trying to measure. So we should not compare apples to oranges. So a little bit more about uh, the analysis that we took further is that we can also perform geodesic distance measurements on the 3D face. Linear distances, they are uh, handicapped because they cut through the features. They do not care what feature comes in between them. They just straight away measure the distance between two points. And they do not take the underlying facial morphology into account. Geodesic distances, they follow the curvature of the face and they encode the facial features. You can see here that if this person has a taller nose, then the distance between this point and this point is going to be greater. So it's just encoding the underlying shape of the face uh, as a geodesic distance in, in this, uh, for a, a taller nose as an increased geodesic distance. However, geodesic, geodesic distances also do not encode all of the underlying facial morphology. We have found that linear plus geodesic distances, when they are combined, they correlate very well with perceived gender scores. They correlate with uh, autism quotient uh, test scores, and they correlate well when measured the geodesic and linear distances. When they are measured in uh, 20, 22 year olds, they correlate very well with the testosterone levels at birth measured in the RAIN study. So we have already found these things, so which is a great indication that if we encode more and more, in, of, more and more of the facial morphology into our model, we're likely to discover more interesting things. So, so what is the core problem in 3D face analysis? So before, before we jump into analyzing 3D faces, we have to be careful of, you know, uh, we, we have to ensure that we are performing the correct measurements. So which points or distances should we measure? You know, should we, if, if we are going to ask human annotators to annotate on certain points, we have to pre-select some points. But how do we know that which points uh, correlate with sleep apnea? We don't know that yet. And can we find these points automatically? If we have, for example, the slides that Peter showed that 30,000 faces and we ask a human annotator to annotate on the eye corners and let's say 15 points on this face, you know, after 10 faces that person would be just clicking anywhere on the face. So there is error from one person to another person, and there is error within the same person when the person gets tired. So can we replace the human annotator with a computer? You know, let's say if you were going to perform point-based measurements, is it possible to take out the human factor from it and give it to a computer so that the computer calculates all these points automatically? Or should our analysis be based on points at all? Right? Because we do not know which points and which distances correlate with sleep apnea. So we have to perform a thorough analysis which does not throw away any of the information in the 3D faces. So the basic question is, how do we compare apples to apples? And asking the right, right question is half the answer itself. Right. So the answer is basically dense correspondences. 
If the 3D scanner is going to get 10,000 points on a face, we want to know exactly those 10,000 points on another face. And by saying that we want to know exactly those points on another face is that the eye corner should correspond to the eye corner, the inner eye points should correspond to the inner, the, the ends of the lips should correspond to the ends of the lips, and so on. And there are thousands of anatomical landmarks. Some of them are really obvious, some of them are subtle. And we want to correspond all of them from one face to the other. And we want to do this for a large number of faces. And this is called dense correspondence. And this is where we have come up with a solution, our research group, and we're trying to apply this solution to different uh, medical applications. So the dense correspondence, I'm not going to go into uh, a lot of details uh, in there because that's the boring bit. Uh, it starts with finding some correspondences at the convex hull so, so that we know that, okay, this is our data points that we want to include, whatever is inside this convex hull. So we start with establishing correspondences on the convex hull of the faces. And in the next step, between every pair of corresponding points, we find a few more points. Now, we have a recursive solution. If we apply step one and uh, uh, step two again and again, we are going to get more and more and more corresponding points in these faces. And once we get them, so like I said, we have to be sure that we are comparing apples to apples. So how can we be sure that our analysis was correct? So this we do with visual analysis because there is no ground truth. There is no gold standard to, against which we can test, which is our visual inspection and humans are pretty good at this. So if you see, sorry, if you see in this video, the, the left face is always going to deform and change into the right face. The target face is then going to change, and it's going to ch change to the second one. Then it is going to change to the third one. And by doing so, you will not see a nose appearing in the lips of the other person, or you will not see the eyes appearing on the forehead of the other person, even though they are of different sizes. Even though some subjects have oval uh, shape, some subjects have a roundish uh, shape, they are being corresponded correctly. And this is, this is the, uh, uh, to the best of our knowledge, the gold standard check for finding out whether the correspondences are correct. So this means that we have, if we see smooth transitions between one face to the other face and so on, between all faces, this means that we have correctly found dense correspondence between all faces. Which then means that we have, uh, we know thousands of points on one face and the exact same thousands of points on all our database. And by doing so, we can establish dense correspondences between thousands of faces and eventually make a morphable model. Right, so once we have a morphable model, we can fit that model into new faces. So when, you, when a new scan comes in, you, know, you have seen those previous scans, they have holes, they have missing data, they have uh, spurious and unwanted data. So we can fit this corresponding, uh, th this dense uh, corresponded morphable model into a new face. And by doing so, we can fill missing points and we can remove unwanted data. And once we have fitted the model into a new face, that new face part becomes part of the model itself. So it's an ever growing model. Okay, so let's get to three things that I want to show you. PowerPoint is really restrictive in terms of what I can show. So I'll go to uh, some other softwares where I can show you a demo of a deformable model where what we exactly mean by you know, these switches when we vary the switches, how the face changes with these switches. So this is a small piece of software that I've written. It's just name it make faces so these are the switches so if i change this switch a little bit up it's going to change the shape of the face now this corresponds to a different feature if i change this down face changes and i can go on making some really very different looking faces <laughs> and even faces that were not originally there in the database because the morphable model basically covers a space, a space where, which we have calculated from points that were actually far from each other. So once we calculate this space, we can travel in this space from one point to the other, even though between those two points there was no third person. 
right? So we can basically generate a large number of faces. And these switches or these slide bars, they are basically uh, the average face plus another 199. And the further you go in, in terms of principal components, the more subtle changes do they capture, right? So our objective now is to find out how uh, to find out these switches, how to change these switches so that they would uh, so that they would fit into the new face, right? And once they fit into the new face, their values would be the, one, the, the uh, would be the signature of that face. And here I have a video of the model changing into uh, Peter, myself, what was the name of the? Maddie. Maddie. Model, Peter, Maddie, myself. And you also notice that because the model does not have a beard. So when it fits into my face, I get this nice, clean shaven uh, person, you know, uh, which I could possibly put on my profile, you know, without a beard. So uh, in, in fact, my, my, my daughter was asking, you know, I mean, uh, I have never seen you without a beard. And I showed her this picture. And I can show you in 3D. This is how I'm going to look without a beard. So right. So you, you can notice here again that the nose is always changing to the nose. The lips are always changing to the lips. And every point on the face, one face is changing to exactly the same point on the other face. And on the model itself, I know the location of every point, every possible point. For example, any point you define, you click on the model, and you, ha you have that click on the 5,000 faces to which this model has been fitted. And the fitting process itself gives us those 200 values. Those 200 values, they form a signature of uh, the face. In fact, we can calculate those 200 values for any part of the face uh, without, uh, I mean, not just the full face, but any part of the face. And now, now I'll show you an example of how we can re remove uh, spurious unwanted data and complete missing data in a face. Now, this is a very rough scan. It's not from a 3DMD. It's from another scanner. This is called Minolta. It doesn't have that many cameras. You only have a front-on camera, so it doesn't get all the ear-to-ear -ear data. And there are a lot of parts that are missing. And uh, you can also see the face is very bumpy. You know, it's very noisy. So after fitting the, the, the model to it, So this is, this is the fitted model. So you see the, how well the, the, the fitted model uh, sort of lays over the, uh, the original. And this is our local fit. This is our global fit. So it's up to us which one we want to use. So after doing a uh, local fit, we can do a, another global one. So it just simply removes the hair and all the data that is unwanted. You can also visualize it as, as a shaded image. So th this was the original one. You can see how it just neglects the, the hair over the forehead and then follows uh, uh, the predicted forehead based on the, the few number of points that, that are available. And it also sort of predicts the, the, the neck. Now, if you are going to do uh, medical measurements, we're not going to predict the neck. We're, of course, going to scan it. But this is just to show an extreme case that even if there is some missing data, the model after fitting would, uh, would follow that part, not using some linear interpolation or some uh, ad hoc measure, but actually using ba based on a uh, the knowledge of previous scans of thousands of faces how this person's neck should look like given the few number of points around it. Right, so let's go to the last uh, slide. Yeah, that's it. So this is all I had to say. And we would like to acknowledge our uh, funding agencies at the end and hope that they keep us funded for the next phase of the project. <laughs>